Hey guys and gals, Nary here from Drake Wayne Gaming. So if you may not sort of the gaming drag today, I'm coming back at another Let's Play episode of Devil's Gambit. So yeah, let's go ahead and jump right back into it, shall we? Alarm chain, you are up, and let's go. All right. Come on, Hector. He's ta talking about a different matter altogether. Don't let your memories distract you from what's in front of you. Besides, you're too old to be sharing a bed and holding hands, no? And the clouds again? No. Anyway, why is he saying that then? Surely he didn't convert to demon worship. I figure it's because of one of the early incidents of the Eye Valley Expedition. Back then, we had more lion workers in town because they hadn't been scared away yet. When Kagan is telling the tale of what happened back then, my eyes drift off to the forest. I can almost see them, dozens of lions crossing into the valley, closely followed by beasts pulling wagons. <laughs> As they near the cursed chasm, they come across ruins. Whether they are of woven origin or belong to a different long-gone civilization, they don't know. All paint, to the, all paint and most engravings have faded or crumbled, leaving no clues at a glance. Crossing the forest had proved challenging despite all the preparation. It projects all who attempt to reach what lies beyond it, be it through fallen trees, rivers overflowing, or wild animals. But now they're almost there. All they need is a ruin that has a ceiling, and for that ceiling not to look like it'll collapse any second. They don't trust this place. They've heard about the dangers in the past expeditions led by Duke Leopoldno and many others who once laid claim to the land. So they send two to check if the walls are holding up, or if the terrace still supports their weight. Are there any predators or pests nesting here? They stop when they find a fitting ruin to make into an outpost. Tomorrow they'll venture into the twisting, breathing depths of the valley in search of a spot to build a settlement. The first of many, according to the Duke. That night, a scout goes up to the terrace to escape the dead air of the ruins. One beast below whimpers. He must have seen a wild animal, he thinks. He looks down, searching for it. Then he spots a shadow dashing toward the woods, along with two bloody rubies that stare back at him. Cadgan brings his axe down again, and adds the wood to a pile beside him. In the following days, the men fell ill one by one, until there wasn't enough peep until there weren't enough people to continue the expedition. After their reunion, that same scout kept saying the shadow was a demon. The Duke dismissed it as a delirium at first, but came around to believing later. God. God, that reminds me of some curses I've read about. What happened then? Sweet bugs. They're a parasitic insect that infests fruit to get eaten and lay eggs inside a host. They're very active this time of year. The lions didn't notice some of the ruins they got in their food. Demon being behind it would be less nightmarish. They only live in the valley, thankfully. I'm never going there. What happened to the lions? They got better, but the more incidents that took place, the stronger the demon rumors grew, scaring more lions away. And the ones that returned home, returned home warned others against participating in the expedition, even in mentioning the demons. And that's how we arrived here. As he can't get more lions, the Duke is plucking wolves from the town instead, and hiring doctors to patch them up when they get hurt. I must say, I must say, this makes me feel guilty that I'm taking the Duke's money. <clears throat> Alrighty. Don't be. It's nobody's fault but the Duke's. Kagan lets go of his axe and throws his arms back in a long stretch. I grip my knees, nails dig into fabric. Heading to the river? Heading to the river. You coming? And then through fabric and fur into my skin. On the way to the river, I'm barely holding a chuckle. I'm walking a few steps behind Kagan, hoping he doesn't notice, though it'd be no wonder it'd be no wonder if he did. The moment he had mentioned the river, my mind conjured a most scandalous image of me and the wolf bathing together, me minding my own business, when he suddenly tackles me from behind, wrapping his arms around me. Then we play wrestle before I let him work my back and shoulders with those large, rugged hands. His fingers scrub away the filth, undoing the knots under my skin. How silly I had felt when in reality he came back out of his shack with his cape on, Carrying a bucket full of clothes in one hand and a board in the other. Such an idiot. Jumping into, jumping into conclusions. This can't be just nostalgia or me being impressed at how much my friend has grown. But what is it then? It makes me so afraid to think about it that my mind goes numb. And with good reason. Hector, you couldn't handle it. You already have enough on your plate. Please, be happy just watching Cadgan. You don't need his hand on yours or your back. Being here with him is a reason enough to be happy. Don't squander it. Besides, I might be jumping to conclusions again. Kagan always brings out my rash side. Here we are. We climb down to the riverbank, and Kagan places his things next to a boulder. Then he undoes the straps on his chest. What are you doing? I don't want these clothes to get wet. The wolf tosses his spalders and cape aside, and his pants are next. 
A gulp as he reveals the well-worn loincloth under. Then he empties the bucket on the bank before sitting down and getting to work. By the way, I got sidetracked with the Duke and whatnot. I wanted to ask how your first day of work went. I, uh... I hope nobody gave you trouble. Some of the more thick-headed folk reject the doctor's help because the Duke hired them. I can't blame them for their anger, but they are directing it at the wrong people. No, no, they were most kind. Good to know. It's silent except for the noise of Kagan rinsing his clothes before throwing them onto the rock to scrub, to scrub and beat them with the board. When he's finished with a piece, he throws it back into the bucket and moves on to the next. God, his pants are barely holding him back before. Now that his loincloth... No, no, stop. Think about anything else, Hector. Talk to him. I've been, I've been meaning to ask, uh, where did you get these? The armor? One morning a knight showed up at home with that and a bag of coins. He dropped them off and told me to keep doing a good job. I learned Manolo appointed me as peacekeeper that same day. Imagine my surprise. Can I see it? The wolf nods and I kneel next to the armor. It's so, it's so heavy that I can't imagine wearing it for a few minutes, let alone most of the day as Cadgan does. Even my untrained eyes can tell it's high quality work. Hmm. And not only the Spalders, but the cape, too. Only knights wear things like this. My nose catches a spicy yet pleasant aroma towards the middle of the cape. It's hard to sense it with the smell of earth and Cadgan mixed in, so I bring it closer to sniff it. It's familiar, like I've sensed traces of this before. Pollen from a flower I've never paid any mind to, perhaps. Uh, Cadgan, what is the smell? The wolf's ear twitches as he comes to my side. I don't think this is through. He's too close. Uh, he takes a whiff and after a moment chuckles. Well, aren't you being cheeky? What is he talking about? But before I can ask, he reaches out to his pants and cautiously smells the backside. My heart stops. I guess I'll clean these too. Oh my god. He clumps the cape and pants together before tossing them onto the pile of dirty laundry. Then he gets up with a grunt, undoes his loincloth, and sends it with the rest of his clothes. I can see his privates dangling out of the corner of my eye. Eh. Since we're at it, do you want me to wash anything of yours, Hector? No worry, I dry it in no time. Mm. No, thank you. All right. As though he had thrown away his careful his carefulness alongside his clothes, Cadgan walks into the river to continue working, not minding in the least that he's getting wet. Oh, God. Woo! Oh, my. If he'll be doing laundry naked, then he might as well get a bit cleaner in the process, he must be thinking. As for me, I'm trying to not be too obvious in my attempt to hide the tent in my pants. His muscles being relaxed compared to when he was cutting wood doesn't make them any less mesmerizing. My god, is he as soft as he looks? I wonder how it would feel to lie on him. Work aside, are you enjoying being back in town? Oh, uh, yes, although I haven't had a chance to relax and talk to people just yet. Uh, besides you, I mean. Who did you have in mind? I had been thinking Finbar, but it turns out I got assigned to him, and so I saw him this morning. I was surprised. He's always been on the shorter side for a wolf, but he still used to be so stocky. Age has been... Age has been rough on him, but it happens. I guess so. Huh. At least his children are helping him with the forge. I mean, at least there's, you know, fur covering that area. Though it seems teaching them to use it has been a big undertaking, too. Uh, big indeed, yes. Kagan is saying something, probably about Fenbar, but what's in front of me occupies my entire world. In my years as a doctor, I've seen my fair share of naked men, but I've never witnessed anything like this. Can I even handle it? I don't know, I've never... Hector, hello? Ah, sorry, I was just thinking. Did you get enough sleep last night? Uh, it's just, uh... I need to take a leak, I didn't want to interrupt you. I'll be right back. Sure thing. I hide behind a tree much farther than needed. I'm still cupping my crotch as though afraid somebody will witness my shame. <sighs> How can I forget? Wolves have anal glands. You were enjoying his ass smell, Hector. How was I supposed to know? It smelled too, smelled too good. Oh god, it smelled too good. The twitching under my tent only adds to my turmoil. And when he took his loincloth off right next to me, what if he had noticed then? Would he have shown me that arrogant smile again? Put his hand on my head, caressed my cheek, and... A, whimp a whimper escapes me as my hand rubs my erection. Fingers tempted to slip under my pants. But you can't, Hector. If you do anything here, Kagan is bound to notice. You shouldn't underestimate a wolf's sense of smell, either. 
Calm down. Think of something clinical, like the knife cuts through the herbs. I, I prick my finger on the scale's hook. The cotton absorbs the blood. The elixir boils. Knife, hook, blood, elixir. Yeah. Thankfully, Kagan is too busy to notice how long it took me to return. We talk about my patience, uh, me keeping my eyes on the river all the while, until the wolf finishes cleaning. Everything but what he was wearing gets thrown into the bucket. Are you going back like this, or... Are you going back like this, or... Of course not. Cadgan looks for a spot with some exposed dirt. Then he buries a claw into the earth and moves his arm, drawing a circle and a shape inside of it. A sigil? I didn't know you were a mage, too. I worked at the shrine for a while, learned some tricks. After tracing a circle around the sigil, Cadgan tosses his wet clothes on top of it and touches the ground. The area around his palm glows as he releases magic, as does the sigil. Perhaps he put too much magic into it, seeing as the sigil's glow intensifies before waning for an instant. But he stabilizes it, and soon the humidity evaporates from his clothes. He then steps on the sigil to dry himself enough to put them back on. Hmm. Good enough. I'll hang, I'll hang the rest to dry. It's a relief that I don't have to keep my gaze from drifting down to his crotch anymore. Now if I only could look him in the face instead of the chest. <laughs> New journal entries have been unlocked. Act 1, Chapter 7, The Sad-Eyed Lady. Let's look at that journal real quick. Hmm. People. Magic. Oh, sweet bugs. A species of insects from the Eye Valley. These creatures have learned to lay eggs inside fruit in order to have a host ingest and incubate them. This process makes the host very sick, though Kagan spared me the details. I should ask him about them, considering I might need to treat their victims one day. Wolven sigils. Many magical traditions involve the use of sigils, but this is especially true for woven magic. I once read there's at least three dozen different schools of woven magic, most of them originating from when they still roamed in tribes, and that each, and each uses sigils in different ways. It sounds impressive, but that's as far as my knowledge goes. Alright. What Dad never warned me about... What Dad never warned me about bad influences, probably because he hoped it would never get to this point, was that they were like toppling a stack of stones. He hit one section and the entire thing crumbled down. One summer night I had been sleeping on the wolf's bed with a book in my hands when Kagan sh shook me awake. When I pried my eyes open and saw darkness beyond the window, I groaned and turned my back to him. Hector! Hector! I have an idea! Wah! The river! Wanna go there? Alright, alright. He shook my shoulder. I don't mean tomorrow, but now. I know a way out. No one will notice. This word sobered me up. Kagan's proposal worried me some, but it was also exciting. Like breaking the boundary I began pushing with our nocturnal reading sessions. However, I wondered what his escape plan was. Security around the mansion was at its tightest at night, and although they let the wolf do as he pleased during the day, I doubted they'd let a child wander into the forest when it was dark. Maybe he could have sneaked past them, but me? Impossible. The way he was pulling at his collar as though nervous inspired little confidence. When we reached the staircase, I made to head downstairs, but Kagan took my hand and pointed toward the Duke's study. This way. I thought we were going outside. You'll get it when you see it. Come on. We stopped in front of a large portrait hanging in the hallway leading to the study. A tall lion lady was sitting with her gang with her hands on her lap, a green garden barely visible behind her. Her gray and her gray, sad gaze was upon us. Who is she? Why do you want to know? Hm, do you fancy lionesses? Punched him in the shoulder, but Kagan made fun of me for how weak it was. And he told me to. And he told me to hold still while he climbed on my shoulders. Here. There was a click, and the portrait's frame came loose, or rather, the wall behind it did. The wolf hopped up, hopped off my shoulders, nearly shocking, nearly knocking me down, and pulled the wall open. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and pause it right there. Thank you all so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, ring that notification bell, and check out our Patreon if you can. It always helps. Before I go, I'm going to give a quick shout out to our lovely bronze tier patrons. Thank you all for I do for the channel. We greatly appreciate your support. Thank you to our silver tier patron, Cade Silverman. Thank you for going a bit above and beyond. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you to our gold tier patron, Trezum Guy. You're awesome. We love you. Thank you for subbing to Ultimate Tier. Anyway, if you all want to get your names in the credits, get access to all of our not safe for work contents as little as $5. Alrighty, I love you all, and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye bye.